All right, hello and welcome to this build guide for my Poison Lich. Now, this is quite a bit different than a lot of the other Poison Lich builds out there in that it doesn't use Aura of Decay, and its primary purpose is to have very high war generation, uh, so it has very high effective health, or EHP, uh, and it uses Rib Blood as its primary damage and war generator, at least as far as skills go. And it's currently sitting at 5th overall on the Softcore leaderboard as of this recording. And 1st overall for Acolyte builds. So it has performed well beyond my expectations. I thought there was a pretty good chance of a decent build here. And it's worked out exceptionally well. Now as far as this guide goes, it's likely going to be a good bit longer than average. Because it's a complex build. And also because I'm going to offer two variants. The first one is the one I used in the arena. And then there's a second one that's a higher damage but lower EHP version that will increase clear speed. All right, so let's jump into the pros and cons of this build. First, the pros. It has very high survivability with the right play style. It has good damage, especially AoE. And it's got a lot of versatility. It can be built to emphasize damage or defense. Uh, but regardless, either way, it won't be bad at either one. As far as cons go, it's got a couple. Uh, first, its damage can take some time to ramp up on high HP enemies because it's a poison play style and it takes a while to get stacks on enemies. Uh, it is quite challenging to gear. We'll talk about that in a minute and a little bit, little bit later as well. Uh, and it's a kite heavy play style that can be difficult for newer players. So with that being said, let's go into a little section that I'm adding to my build guides that I haven't used in the past, which is a rating system for basically how difficult a build is to play or what kind of experience a player should have before attempting these builds. And the reason that I'm going to incorporate this is because a lot of people have tried to play some of my builds that were a good bit too advanced for maybe their experience at the time. So this should help viewers decide if a build's appropriate for them. This rating system is going to have three levels. First one is beginner friendly, which basically just means no experience necessary. You follow the guide and you're good to go. The second one's experience. You should have at least some experience with the end game of Last Epoch and progressing a character. And the third one is advanced, where the build requires items that must be farmed and or the play style is relatively challenging. Uh, you must have the items required before attempting this sort of build and or you must be ready for a build that is stylistically challenging to play. Now this particular build is in the advanced category, largely due to requiring two uniques and a number of specific idols. The playstyle is also somewhat challenging, but players who know how to kite will not find it too difficult. All right, another thing I want to incorporate that I haven't in the past is some things you should look for after I've made this guide and then other patches have been released. So some of my guides have become at least somewhat obsolete just because of the speed at which this game gets patched, which is a good thing, but as far as for the guides go, it's not. So after I've released this guide, and if you see a patch that comes out between the release and when you want to play it, here are two things to look out for that could affect this build. First off, did Poison get nerfed in any way? Uh, as far as the upcoming patch, which we're a few weeks away from, I think this is fairly unlikely. Outside of Primeless getting some Poison nerfs, so I think it's not going to be affected, but I can't know that for sure, of course, because I don't know exactly what they're going to be adding to the game. Uh, the other thing to look out for are ward nerfs. Nerfs to ward generation, nerfs to exsanguinous, and anything of that, that nature. Uh, these, are, I think, are much more likely than poison nerfs. And in fact, this build is kind of a showcase for ward to show how strong ward is right now. And also, there's a 616 wave build that Holy Coffee recently ran. Uh, and it was largely based around war generation. That's how he's able to get that high. Speaking of Holy Coffee, a uh, shout out to him for his theory crafting on Ward, of which we've incorporated a large amount of it into this build. So this build wouldn't work the same way if it weren't for some of the ideas he came up with and tested himself. Okay, now that we've got all that out of the way, let's go ahead and get into the build. And we'll start with the actual skill trees, the skills and specializations. And we'll start with the sort of star of the show, which is Rip Blood. This skill has poison nodes in it, and you might think that, well, this being a poison build, we're going to take Septic Wound and we're going to take Septic Blood. But you would not be correct. We're not going to take those at all. We're actually going to rely on other sources of poison 
in order to apply our poison stacks. And we're going to do something quite a bit different with this build. So let's first start with uh, the first thing you want as far as damage goes is to pick up Eviscerate and five points in Splatter. Now these are going to allow you to create a blood splatter on the ground around enemies that you hit. So it's an AoE attack. But by picking up Splatter and by picking up Eviscerate, we're going to actually do two blood splatters in the same spot every time we attack with Rip Blood. Now that's important because each blood splatter that hits an enemy will apply all of our poison stacks. And so by doing two blood splatters, we're actually doubling the amount of poison stacks that we apply to any enemies hit by blood splatter. So a lot of our damage in AoE is going to come from these two nodes. Now we're also going to pick up two in Crimson Flood. That gives us 50% more area allows it to hit more enemies. That is really, other than three points in Hemomancer, all we're going to do for as far as actual damage. So then from there, we're going to take two points in Arcane Absorption, which gives us global increased spell damage, which actually does very little for us, but allows us to pick up Rip Spirit, which will convert physical to necrotic. Another node that's not actually going to do anything for us, but it will ultimately allow us to get to Arcane Fortress, which is what we really want, because we need to convert health granted from this ability into ward granted. Otherwise, we're going to be healing up, and that's actually going to work against Arc Sanguinous. We'll talk about how that works when we get to the gearing section of it. We definitely need to have Arcane Fortress. Once we've taken that, I've already mentioned three points in Hemomancer. Four points in Quenching gives us 16 additional health granted. And that will be turned into ward, by the way. And Hematology gives us an additional percentage of health restored from the blood orbs by 5% for each point of intelligence that we have. Now this build is going to have a lot of intelligence. You can see here, I have 80 intelligence. So 80 times five, do the math, it's a good number. And that's how much more health we're getting from each blood orb that we receive. All right, let's move on to some of the other important skills that we're going to be using in this build. Another very important one is transplant. Now this is normally used for uh, mobility and it certainly is playing that role here but it's not only playing that role it's going to play a high damage role largely because of dance blood which is going to allow us to cast rip blood three times to enemies near where we depart uh, every time we cast transplant transplant's got a four second cooldown so it's a very short cooldown and the rip blood range that it can actually hit enemies from where you depart is actually pretty high so you'll hit a lot of targets here because we have the blood splatter and the AoE, you're going to see large amounts of enemies get hit. Uh, all, at, towards the end of the arena, most of my damage was actually coming from transplant procs of rep blood, not actual casts myself. This is a very strong note. We're also going to go up and we're going to take two points in sadism for the global increased damage. That's also going to get us to pill blood, where we'll get 30% uh, of our mana missing restored every time we cast transplant. So it's nearly impossible for us to run out of mana if we're using transplant consistently. And then we'll go over and take bone armor, three points in that, increase uh, or decrease our damage taken and increase our armor. And we'll take three more points in apostasy, which increases the duration by three seconds. So I believe it goes from four, yes, from four to seven seconds with a 10 second cooldown. So 70% uptime if you're using um, transplant on cooldown. And finally, we'll go down and we'll take uh, simulcrum and we'll take purgatory and we'll take ivory core. This is going to allow us to uh, cast bone minions every time we transplant. And their primary purpose is really just going to be to distract enemies, give us a little bit of time to uh, move around. Some enemies really like attacking bone minions for some reason. And so they won't be attacking us. That's good for everybody. Right, the next skill we're gonna talk about is Mark for Death. And this plays a vital role in our build as it plays the CC role. So the real stars of the show for Mark for Death, even though it is an increase in our damage, which is nice, we really want our chill and fear, especially fear. So we're going to take uh, the chill node, we're going to take the fear node, we're going to take four points in opposing will to increase the duration of both of those. Then we'll take five points in the area so we hit more enemies, get fear more enemies, and chill more enemies. Five points in mana efficiency, just another way to uh, keep our mana from ever running out. And we'll finish off with four points in marked for death duration so that we can do damage for a longer period of time to those enemies that have been marked. All right, the last important skill in this build is Wandering Spirits. It's also the least important of the quote important skills. It's really just a war generator. It does do a little bit of damage. We are going to convert it to poison damage. What we want here is ward in some mana. So we're going to take four points of medium for mana efficiency. 
we're going to take two points in Sheltering Spirit for that ward gain every time a spirit dies. And we're going to take two points in Infusing Souls for more mana every time a spirit dies, expires technically. Then we're going to go down, we're going to take one point in Lingering Souls, which is going to increase spirit duration, which we actually don't want, but we need that in order to get Spirit Swarm. Uh, and increase cooldown recovery speed, so we can cast this more frequently. And like I said, we'll take Infectious Dead to give us some poison damage. We're also going to take two points in Souls of Rage for Spirit Movement Speed and Damage. This is actually taken last. Before you take this, take uh, five points in Thin Veil, which increases the reveal rate, therefore increases the number of uh, souls that are out, which therefore increases the amount of ward we get and mana we get. And this will give you probably another 150 or so HP, I'm going to guess. So it's not actually a big number, but there's nothing else that needs to be put on our skill bar. So it's basically a free 150. It doesn't cost enough to ever be a, a problem mana-wise. It actually gives us mana. So this is a nice little extra side to have. The last thing we'll talk about is Raper Form. This is actually unnecessary. You don't need this. I've only used it a few times in the arena, although I probably could have taken advantage of it more. Um, what we're going to use this for primarily is both for it can be a, a bursty damage increase but also a, a defensive cooldown because when you go into reaper form you get an additional health bar but when you do that you're going to disrupt the, the generation of your exsanguinous for a, a relatively short period of time when you come out and you'll actually have a little bit less ehp so that's why i used it sparingly and suggest you do so as well but in a pinch this can help you take down a big boss or it can keep you alive with that extra health pool long enough for you to get out of whatever you're into, and then the lowered EHP for a few seconds won't really affect you. All right, so here's how we build this out. Four points in Mistress of Decay for the health drain and the damage over time. One point in Harbinger of Blood, which is really just to get to the five points in Phantom Restoration or increase our ward retention. And we gain ward with Reap. We're not actually going to use that, though. The ward retention is really the only thing we want here. And we're going to take one point in Ghastly Flow to get up to four points in Reaper's Curse, where we increase our damage while, while we're in Reaper form. This, by the way, if you don't know, Rip, Rip Blood can be cast in uh, Reaper form. That's why these are beneficial to have the damage over time, to have the increased damage. And increased damage does affect damage over time, even though it doesn't say it on there. It does, trust me. And then we'll take four points in Reaper's Blessing, 160 ward on Transform, and then we'll take one point in Protective Spirit, another 160 when we leave Reaper form. So a nice little kind of buffer when we have the exsanguinous interruption. And that's all there is to the skill trees. That's all you got to do. We'll move on from here into the passives. So before we start the passive skill tree, just a quick note as far as the two variations of this build goes. There's no change in the actual skills. That's why... I've covered that and, and we're good to go. You can use that for either one. There will be a change in the passive tree and a small change in the gearing. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to cover the arena part first, and I'll do the same thing for the gearing. And then after both of those two sections, I will give you the layout of the variant, which should be pretty short. There's really not a whole lot that changes. Okay, let's talk about the passive tree. So this passive tree is designed primarily to worry about defensive over damage. So you'll notice that most of these nodes are going to go in that direction and we'll have passed over some damage nodes. We'll take some of those damage nodes in the variant. Here's how it works for the arena push that I did. We're gonna take eight points in forbidden knowledge. This is not so much for necronic protection, it's for intelligence. Why do we want intelligence? Well, because ward retention is huge to get the kind of EHP that you see this build carrying. You can see right now I'm, I'm carrying almost 3,700 ward just standing in one place, not even having Wandering Spirits on. If I turn Wandering, wandering Spirits on, I'll be even closer to 4,000. Uh, that's a lot of EHP. And one of the ways we're doing it is by having a very high ward retention. You see here about almost 500%. So one of the best ways of getting that is intelligence, and here it is. Um, a Mania of Mortality is something we're going to take for additional ward regeneration. When your enemy ally or minion dies, you have a 10% chance to gain 130 ward. Now, it's a nice little buffer. It really definitely does boost it up. When we're in fights, we'll get up to like five to 6,000 uh, ward. So it can be, get pretty huge. And this is one of the reasons why. Not the only one, but one of them. And then we're going to take four or four unnatural preservation for the 20% ward retention. It's got more necrotic and poison protection. That's nice, but it's not what we're here for. We're really here for the ward retention. Okay, let's talk about necromancer real quick. There's only... Uh, two nodes we need to take here. We take 8 and 8 of Elixir of Hunger for 40 health. 
why are we taking health when we're using Exsanguinous? We'll discuss this a little bit more when I get to the uh, gearing section, but the more health you have, the more ward you generate with Exsanguinous. So that's why we're going to take health here. Uh, Reclamation of Souls, gain 35 ward when minion dies, but we really want that 35% ward retention. That's the, the big key here. That's all we need in the Necromancer. Then we move on to Lich. We're going to take 8 of 8 in Crippling Insight. Again, this is for 60 intelligence. That reduced health generation is actually a good thing. We don't we don't want much health regen, so we're totally fine with that. We'll take 8 and 8 in Survival of the Cruel. Get 40 health. This has the uh, negative effect of having spell damage leeches health, which we do not want to leech. That's okay, because we're going to go and take Hollow Lich, which is going to turn all sources of health leech into damage, increased damage at 10 times their value. So this is a nice offensive buff uh, from a defensive buff. From there, we're going to take 2 of 8 in Desolation, deal increased damage over time. We will take 8 of 8 in Lasting Stench, 56% increased poison damage, and 56% increased poison duration. We'll take 8 of 8 in Apocrypha. Grants 24% increased spell damage and 8 intelligence. This is purely for the 8 intelligence. We don't really care about the spell damage. It's pretty nominal on this character. Spell damage does not affect poison, but we want that intelligence. We'll also take 5 of 5 in Mental Cacophony. 25 ward retention, 25 mana. You can probably guess why we took this one, the ward retention. Then we're going to take uh, 5 of 10 in Decaying Form. 65% chance to poison on hit. 15% increased poison damage taken. Don't care too much about the poison damage taken. That poison on hits pretty substantial though. And then we'll fill out. This character is a level 81, so we're up to 17 of 20 on mind over body. Gives us a 34, well, the plus 34 intelligence. We lose 17% of our current health per second. We don't care about losing our health per second. We're already losing our health per second. That doesn't matter at all. Uh, that intelligence is huge for our ward retention. Is 34 times 4 is how much uh, ward retention we're getting from that. And once we level higher than that, we will finish up. The mind of Rabani, put three more points into that. Then we'll pop down here. We'll take five points in decaying form. That gets us to like 88. Uh, we'll take a point here in three plagues, and we'll probably be just about finished up with Contagion Engine. And if for some reason we still have points over, we might have a few. We can go down there and take Desolation, and that will finish out the tree completely. Okay, let's move on to gearing. This section is probably going to take me a few minutes to cover. There's some advanced stuff that happens in here. Um, even more advanced than I even mentioned in the introduction, because some of the affixes are pretty high level. So I'm going to take my time a little bit here, try to cover everything so that you all know exactly what you need. First thing we'll talk about are the uniques. There are two uniques that this build requires, must have. The first one is Plague Bearer Staff. This is going to be a large portion of where we get our poison from. It's not the only source, but it is most of it. So you can see here, I have a pretty decently rolled Plague Bearer Staff. You definitely want a higher rolled one. I started off with a lower rolled one, and it was okay. Um, but you're going to see a big difference in damage if you get a higher rolled one. So we got 189% chance to poison on hit on this one. You get up to 250. 172% increased Plague Effect. Plague is a basically a poison with a debuff. You can see here it uh, deals poison over time and spreads to enemies around the target, but it doesn't stack, so it's just an additional poison, basically. 15% um, chance to inflict blinding poison on hit, which is pretty self-explanatory. Blinds and it poisons. 5% chance to blind attackers, and then the health drain per second. We don't care about that, but we do care about the uh, the base on us, damage, increased damage over time. We have 107%, which is not too shabby. Got to have this for the build. If you try running without, you're going to have a bad time. You can try maybe running a staff with... Poison damage and um, uh, poison hit. I think you can have both of those on a staff. If you can, you can run a version of this, but it's not going to be nearly as effective. Plague Bear staff is a huge upgrade. The next thing we must have, this one is even more a must have. There's no version of this build working without Exsanguinous. Gotta have it. So I'll try to quickly cover Exsanguinous. It can be kind of difficult for some people to grasp because it the mechanics are a little weird on it. So what Exsanguinous does is you'll lose 20% of your current health per second, and you'll gain 20% of your missing health as ward per second, which means the more missing health you have, the more ward you will generate every second. And so the lose 20% of your current health per second is just going to get you down to, like, see, I've got 39 health. But there's twofold reasons why this can be uh, a very powerful, um, unique right now in the game. The first one is because that 20% of your missing health as ward per second is going to scale with how much health you actually have. So you see here, I have 1,300 health. That's a reasonably high level of health, and I could go higher and would if I was going to continue with this build uh, to push it towards level 100. I'd definitely be stacking health, even be more than I have now, because the more health I have, the more ward I get. 
The other big thing is ward retention, because ward retention will allow you to retain more of that missing health as ward per second that you are, you are uh, generating. So those two things together are primarily why we have almost 3,700 ward right now. Exsanguinous, high health, and high ward retention. That's how you get there. So how do we get that high ward retention? We talked about the intelligence and the ward retention on the passive skill tree. Those are both very important to it, but they're not the only way you can get it. Another thing we've done here is we've taken a couple of idols that have ward retention. I got lucky and have two very high tier uh, ward retention idols, a 38 and a 40, 40 is as high as you can get. So that gives me 78% more ward retention just from those two idols. So getting idols that have that kind of ward retention, very valuable for this build. Not absolutely must have, but pretty important. Uh, you'll, you'll perform way better with them than without. The other two idols we have here are also pretty well ruled in that they both have an, a prefix and a suffix that's very valuable for this build. Uh, I have increased damage over time while at low health, and since we're running Exsanguinous, we're always at low health, so we always have the increased damage. Uh, and poison chance uh, on spell hit, which this is a spell that we're attacking with, so we have the poison chance. Both of these ruled similarly, although this one clearly ruled better. So these are pushing the offensive side of this build substantially. So the two offensive and then the two defensive. These ones, by the way, I could definitely get better versions of these, although the ward retention is very, very high. The um, the prefix is pretty much useless. Uh, this one is completely useless. And this one gives us some you know, stun avoidance, so that's, a, that's fine. But we could definitely do better than that. But if you have the ward retention, if you have the damage when, out, when low in health, damage over time when low in health, and the poison... Um, uh, chance procs uh you're going to be look, looking really good on this build as far as idols go okay but what about the rest of the gear what are the things that you need to focus on as far as stats go all right so the first thing you want to worry about is getting very high or as high as you can health now there are a couple of affixes on your gear that you can craft that will help this, but one will help it more than others, and it's hard to find. So you're going to have to do a lot of either farming or gambling with the right items to get this. That is a health per equipped item with this fix. And this is really good because it basically multiplies on itself. The more items you have with the affix, the more you'll get of that health buff. So in this particular case, I have four, one, two three and four and that's as many as i can possibly get you can't get any more of that and so what this basically means is i have plus 28 health here per uh equipped item with the effects so that's 28 times four is how much i'm getting from that but i'm also getting 29 times four here 26 times four here and 31 times four here so it works very similar to chance to receive a glancing blow per equipped item with this effects uh, it's just for health. Now, the other places you can get health from are there's a suffix that gives you a flat. You can see your plus 10. And then on a couple of items, like uh, I think there's actually one for helmet that I don't have, but I have it here on the belt. There's a percentage health, which you definitely want that. So this is a tier 5 ruled health one. It's uh, 12%. So it's just going to multiply all of the health I have. This, this belt in particular is quite nice on the health side. Plus 79 health and then 12% increased health. And those affixes are how you get this higher um, health. I could definitely add more health, would definitely add more health going forward, but 1300 is not too shabby. The next thing you want to do is get your glancing blow to 100%, which we have done. We are at 115% actually. And then after that's done, the only other stat you really need to worry about is getting intelligence. If you can get intelligence in your gear, like the plus seven I've got here, that's 28% ward uh, retention right there. Uh, it's not going to do anything for your damage. That's okay. We don't really care too much about the damage. I mean, if you get lucky and you find a poison damage or a chance to poison on hit, and it also happens to have your defensive stuff, awesome. But really focus those three things right now if you're going to try the arena-style uh, push for this uh, this build. Even if you're not, like there's other ways of getting damage. Uh, getting the defensive stuff is going to be key. So once again, get as much health as you can. Use the health uh, set of fix. Uh, then... After you've done that, get your glancing blood 100%, and then worry about getting as much intelligence as you can. That's going to be your three primaries for gearing up. Everything else is extra. Getting poison, that's extra. Getting armor and prots, that's extra. Focus those three first, and then anything else you can get is great. All right, so let's move on to the variant version of this build. So the variant is meant for people who don't necessarily care about pushing as far as they can in the arena, which I actually think is probably most people and would rather have a 
decent amount more damage and give up a little bit of that EHP and still have good EHP, so they're going to be pretty survivable. But we'd like to clear stuff a good bit faster. So there's only two things we really need to do to give this quite a bit more damage. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a, a few adjustments to the passive skill tree. And most of what we're going to do is just not worry about mind over body, at least not at first. Instead of putting points into mind over body, we're going to put them into decaying form. So we'll put five more into decaying form. It's going to give us another 65% chance to poison on hit. So two out of three of our attacks will put additional stack of poison on. Then we'll take one point in three plagues and five points in contagion engine. Damage will increase by 100% for sources of damage over time, which is of course poison if we've killed an enemy recently. After you've done that, then you just switch back over to mind over body and you'll be good to go. You could also choose to put some more points in the desolation, should you wish, if you want to go even more damagey. You could definitely ignore mind over body and I think you'll probably be at like 2,500 or so board. That's plenty for most content. So that's really up to you exactly how you want to run that, but I definitely would start with the Kang form. Um, and then probably go to Contagion Engine just because it's 100% compared to uh, whatever, 6 times 4. It's They're pretty close. You could really do either one, but that's where I'd go with it. The other thing we're going to do, and it's pretty minor, is we're just going to take more of these idols. Increase damage over time while at uh, low health and or poison chance on spell hit instead of these idols. So we'll cut out the word retention in the idols, and we'll put more of these in, assuming you can, of course farm these. These are not super easy to find, but if you want to really push your damage, that's the other way you could do it. And if you do those two things alone, you're going to have very high damage, especially if you have a, an enemy that will allow you to put a bunch of stacks on it, and your EHP will still be pretty solid. Then moving on to our final section here, we're going to talk about the rotation, how you'll basically play the build. Now normally I do this by showing you on screen as I'm clicking buttons, but honestly for this build I think it's a little bit easier to see how it works while watching gameplay video. So I'm going to have gameplay video going on while I'm explaining exactly what we do. The first thing you want to do is you want to put Wandering Spirits on autocast. That's going to allow you to maintain your ward at a higher level than you'd otherwise would have if you're trying to cast it on your own or just not using it at all. And it also does a little bit of damage because the Wandering Spirits will poison stuff. So that will be taken care of. You won't have to worry about it. And of course, we're going to use Rip Blood to do most of our damage. But for the most part, a better way of doing that is just to transplant around every four seconds, being relatively close to enemies so that they actually get hit by the three uh, stacks of Rip Blood. Then supplement that with additional rip blood attacks when it's safe to do so. And the only other thing you really need to worry about in this build, as far as rotations go, is when to use Mark for Death. And my personal opinion on this is use Mark for Death when things get too close, because then you can fear them and they will start running away from you. Another really good way of using this is when you have projectile enemies who are trying to laser you as they like to do in Last Epoch, you hit them with Mark for Death and they run away and stop attacking you and they'll actually stop uh, clumping up together. So it's a really good way of avoiding getting a laser down by those types of enemies. Uh, Mark for Death will also work as a chill and it also works as a damage increase. So there are lots of uses for it. It has no cooldown and it doesn't cost much in this build. It's only five mana and this build's really good at, at managing its mana. So I probably should put that in the pros, but whoops. Uh, but yeah, it's very good at managing mana, so you don't really have to worry about it. You can use it pretty liberally uh, to both CC and to increase your damage as, as you wish to do so. Now, there is another skill that we have. I do suggest using it only from time to time when you feel the need, like when you need to take down a, a boss and it's maybe slow or it's unlikely to get too close to you very often but it has like a high health pool, Reperform can increase your damage. Or if you get stuck and you don't have the ability to fear, this is usually only going to happen when fear is on cooldown. Fear, by the way, has a an internal cooldown that's separate from Mark for Death. And I believe it's probably close to 10 seconds. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but just in my play, playing of this build, it seemed to be about 10 seconds before I could fear again. So if that happens and you get bunched together with a bunch of enemies that you cannot fear out to, to run away, then 
Reaper form gives you a second health bar, and that could be enough to keep you alive. But otherwise, use Reaper form sparingly because it will drop your EHP down for a period of time. And so it is a double edged sword, so to speak. Well, that's pretty much it for how to play it. Now, I did list this as more advanced on playstyle, and that's because you really do need to kite enemies to be effective in this build. You can't let them get close very often. Even though you have that very high health pool, you don't have much for armor and prots. And your war generation is going to be slower than, say, if you were leeching or if you were healing a health pool. So you can take quite a few hits, but you can't take them for a sustained period of time. So you have to kite in order to allow yourself to get that ward rebuilt if you do take a few shots. And you're going to take hits, especially if you start pushing this in arena. And that's why this build works so well, because you won't get one shot from just about anything. I don't even think I got one shot when I finally did die at wave 371, I believe. I got surrounded and couldn't get out. So um, you'll have a very strong ability to survive even a couple of hits, but you got to move out and regen if you want to stay alive. Hey, we reached the end of the video. We've covered all of the bases. I hope you have a lot of fun with this build. I can tell you that I did the arena run that I did for the 371 or whatever number we did. I normally wouldn't go that high, but I was enjoying the build enough to where I decided to keep pushing it. Um, so I found it to be a lot of fun. I hope you do as well. All right, so I stream on Twitch five to six days a week. Love to have you guys. Some of you have started to hang out with me on Twitch. That's awesome. I really, really love having you all hang out, ask questions. I don't care if they're questions from a brand new player or uh, more advanced questions. They're all great. If you just want to hang out, if you just want to lurk, it's all cool. And if you're not much for Twitch or you are, but you also just want to ask questions, say in Discord, my Discord is here. I'm active in it a lot. I'm, I'm constantly... Uh, chatting with people when people are chatting with me so feel free to hop in there also my stream times are on there and i also announce new videos on there so you will keep up to date with all of the ongoings for both of my channels all right everyone have a great time enjoy last epoch as much as i do i will see you again real soon